Hi everybody, here we are once again with yet another KO2 video. This might be a channel first, and I'm sorry if you got sick of it, but honestly, I've just been having a lot of fun with it. So I was doing a review for something else, and I just caught up doing something very cool with this, and I thought, hell, why not share? I know there's been a lot of uh, complaints and, you know, reports about the fader. I'm glad to say that at least on my part, nothing has failed yet. The thing is pretty stable. I haven't had any errors with it. I did receive um, an email from B&H, which I bought it from, and they were like, if you've got a defective unit, return it and we'll replace it uh, pretty much immediately, I think. I don't know. But at least it's good to know that third party sellers are responding and hopefully Teenage Engineering is also handling the issue. Anyway, so in my last video, one of my main gripes about the KO2 was that you don't have resampling. And that can be pretty complicated in a machine that only has 12 voices of mono samples and six voices of stereo samples. So it can get very cramped. If memory serves, I think that's the same voice count that the original SP404 and the SP4SX had, but you didn't feel it was that cramped because you had resampling. So you could just, you know, sum up different groups or different samples, so it wouldn't be that much of a problem. You still had voice dealing though. Now, in some devices, you have the ability to prioritize, you know, last note played or first note played. So you won't, for example, have a pad going and suddenly it'll just black out. And that's what happens over here. So the question then became, how do I keep this portable yet a bit more powerful, more flexible? You know, because I'm not going to be lugging around the Sub 37 or the Polyboot with it. And if I'm going to just go using my big synths, I'm going to go use my MPCX. Doesn't make sense to keep on using this. But in limitations, there breeds creativity. And I remember I have this little guy right here. This is the Micro Monster 2, and I have a full review on it if you want to check it out. It's an amazing little polysynth, fully digital, of course, but it has 12 voices, and get this, it has bitimbrality, which means I can control two synths, two different patches with the KO2 and bring it back in live. And that just opened up a whole new world in here. So this is the little gem that I'm working on. Okay, it was feeling nice, but as soon as I started adding more voices in group D, where I sampled my voice to make this very weird... As I said before, sampling your voice into this usually yields amazing results. For example, let's go into an empty patch here and... Like and subscribe! Like and subscribe! Sounds great! Like and subscribe. Right, let's trim it down... Like, 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 like. Let's use it in keys. Like, 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 like. Yeah, like and subscribe. <laughs> but the thing is, once I started using that, I started muting the main riff and it didn't sound that nice. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm starting on the second bar is because when you press record play, it'll just start recording on the bar that you're on. So in this case, I forgot to reset it to bar one. For example, if I go for bar three, it'll just start over there. And I haven't figured a way to make it, you know, record from the start like you can on the MPC. It's not a deal breaker. It's something that you have to keep your eye on because <laughs> something like this will happen where my loop actually starts on bar two. Not a big deal. I kind of fixed it in the next uh, scene, but okay, let's work with that. So what I want to do now is I want to sequence the micro monster into the KO2. So first I connected the MIDI out into the MIDI in over here and I'm taking the audio out into the input. Now regarding the live audio input, you can tweak the amplitude, the gain of it, right? And you can also send it into the master effects on the KO2. It's pretty useful. For example, if I'm using the Ocos, which doesn't have any internal effects. But in the case of the Micro Monster, it has a delay, it has chorus, has reverb. So since I'm going to be using this as a bass patch and kind of a pad, and they'll both go into the delay, it gets really messy really fast. So no KO2 effects on the Micro Monster. One thing that I really love about the Micro Monster is that even though it's tiny, micro, one might say, it also has some very good macro knobs. You have the filter, you have the resonance, you have a mod knob, and you also have direct access to the delay and reverb. You can customize all this. But for example, if I start out my sequence here, start opening up, and we start opening up the reverb, 
and the delay. <laughs> I love this thing. So if you're wondering how to sequence MIDI, it's actually pretty straightforward. You pick a pad, you go into sound, edit, and you go into MIDI. And there you just choose a channel. Channel 9, over here it's always set so the first patch is, for example, channel 9. Then the second patch, patch B, is going to be channel 10. And that's my second patch. And what's really cool is that you can play it chromatically. Easy peasy. Now, a really good tip that's in the manual is that if you have, for example, a pad that has a sound on it, you can assign MIDI to it. The thing is, if you have a sound loaded on it, it'll steal voices. So what you do is you go over here and you choose, for example, a pad that does not have anything or you just straight up delete the sound. That way it won't steal the voices. It'll just sequence MIDI. Pro tip right there. Let's try it out. Beautiful. Now, what I think is genius about the MIDI is that there are a few things that you can tweak with the fader. Like, for example, I can set the fader to tune. And now I can go one octave higher, one octave lower. That's pretty fun. Very important note, it's not going to affect a note that's already been triggered by MIDI. It will affect the next note that's triggered. Let's see if I can demonstrate it. If I trigger the note and start wiggling around the fader, nothing's going to happen until the next note is triggered. See? But now one octave higher, one octave lower, octave higher, normal. That opens up a lot of possibilities in the live performance aspect. So now I have this set up and I'm really liking where it's going, but here comes the really fun part. And this is why I eventually just had to make a video about it, is that I discovered, or I'm not sure if I discovered is the right word, but I've found my favorite thing to do on this. And I know everybody likes to do the punching effect, but I feel that kind of gets limited pretty quickly. I found something else. So we go to track A, which is my drums, right? And if you press timing and some of the drums, you get beat repeat. But what I'm really loving is combining the beat repeat with the pitch shifting. And if we mute down the other groups and go to A, you can do something like this. What can I say? This thing is uh, it's very, very fun to play around with. <sighs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. This was extremely fun to make. And don't worry, I will be covering other gear soon. I just needed to get this off my chest. I hope, with <laughs> I hope you found this video useful or at least entertaining. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>